Good evening and welcome. I'm James Hudnup Weimler, Dean of the Divinity School, and I welcome you to the 2009 Cole Lectures. It is especially good to see so many alumni here for a reunion weekend and so many uh, students from the freshman campus uh, to renew the long tradition of this university. There's a great old line in academic circles that goes something like this. Did you hear about Professor so-and-so leaving Vanderbilt for Duke? <laughs> yes, it's a miracle. By moving, he improved two universities at once. <laughs> Our speaker tonight, the Reverend Dr. James Lawson, pulled off a hat trick. He accomplished nothing short of a paradoxical miracle. He improved this university first by attending it and thus by attaching its history to that of the civil rights movement, particularly in Nashville. He improved it a second time by getting expelled and causing a transformative crisis of conscience for Vanderbilt's faculty, both at the Divinity School and well, well beyond. And he's improved it a third time by allowing us as a university to come to a mature understanding of how he is in service, in moral leadership, and in his resistance to evil, our finest model of how a member of the Vanderbilt community should interact with the human community. In each of these improvements, James Lawson has progressively helped this university find its conscience, or dare I say, its soul. Permanently expelled from Vanderbilt, James Lawson would have done fine and well. He is a child of God who knows his way. But Vanderbilt could not be fine or well without confronting its troubled soul 50 years ago. And in the end, a deal was brokered to allow James Lawson to finish his degree and to retain the faculty of the Divinity School. Now, as it turns out, James Lawson did not complete his Divinity degree here, but at Boston uh, University School of Theology. But he came back. He came back to Tennessee, and he came back to the Divinity School and possesses the Doctor of Ministry degree from later in that decade. But what of Jim Lawson? Well, as I say, he finished his divinity degree at Boston University School of Theology and briefly considered staying on to study for the PhD like his friend and colleague, Martin King. Instead, he listened to his heart and to the call he had received as a teenager back in Massillon, Ohio, to be a pastor of a congregation. As Providence would have it, he was assigned to a dispirited Scots United Methodist Church in Shelbyville, Tennessee. This church was in such bad condition that when it rained outside, it rained on the heads of the worshipers, too. In 14 months, he helped the church sell its property, recover its dignity, and move to a new building and revitalize its life. Soon, Jim's bishop was sending him to Memphis, where he would continue to bring congregations back to life and to enable a witness to their faith. James Lawson is justifiably known as a civil rights leader, but we would be remiss, particularly in this location, if we failed to notice that his work was always done as the pastor of a local church, five congregations in some. Taking care of souls and taking care of society are, for Lawson, part of one job, not two. In over half a century of service as a pastor to five congregations as, and as the teacher of the nonviolent civil rights movement, and now as the teacher 
of a new generation of Vanderbilt University students, Jim Lawson has answered his calling. And we are grateful that he will be addressing us this night and tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in this year's Cole Lectures. A reception for all in the faculty reading room located behind me will follow Dr. Lawson's remarks in a brief question and answer period. For now, please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. James Lawson. Thank you very much, Jim. I want to express my deep appreciation to Vanderbilt and to the Div dean of the Divinity School and Doug Knight, who was acting dean last year. Uh, for the privilege of being here this evening. I want to express my appreciation to all of you who are here for the Cole Lecture. It was a rather remarkable invitation uh, to be here on the 15th of October on this evening. And I stand in some degree of dread and humility for the lectureship, 110 years, 119 years rather, imagine that. Uh, just its longevity should make anyone shrink from the responsibility of being the lecturer. But as I've looked across the list of all of those who have been lecturers in those 119 years, I can't help but sense some degree of awe uh, for many of them, several of them were people that I read back in the 40s and the 50s, and I consider them uh, persons who uh, mentored me and taught me and encouraged me in a great variety of ways. I won't try to name the ones who I have seen on that list. But I'm grateful for this moment and grateful for the reception that I've had across these last four or five years here at Vanderbilt. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. Now, I want to call out the members of my class this semester. Let's ask them, please, to stand. I'll, I'll count them quickly so I know that they're all here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> I, I want to simply ask across the, 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 this gathering, um, are there people who are here this evening who were here when I was a student in 1958, 1960? I want you just to please stand. I know Bedford Transfer is here. Just please stand, wherever you are. Yes, good. <laughs> I, I appreciate your presence a great deal. Uh, I couldn't but help uh, be reminded that uh, when I transferred my work into Vanderbilt in September of 1958, I had no idea of the quality of people and community that I would meet in the Divinity School and at Vanderbilt as a whole. Bedford Transu maybe does not know this, but he was one of the folk that uh, I often had lunch with in Rand Hall. Um, I learned much later that I was not supposed to go to Rand Hall to eat. <laughs> but we, uh, we enjoyed being in the Divinity School, and we enjoyed our fellowship and conversation, so that was the nearest place for us to eat, and that's where we would go. But I'm very grateful to Vanderbilt and to um, 
this evening's opportunity. Nashville and Vanderbilt have always meant something special for my family. I met my wife Dorothy here in 1958, and we celebrated our 50th year of marriage earlier this year of 2009. <clears throat> We have three adult sons, one of whom was born here in Nashville. And if all goes well, we hope that there will be down the road another Lawson who will come to Vanderbilt one day as an undergraduate. But I'm grateful for being here and appreciate the privilege that is mine. My theme this evening is seek the kingdom First, seek the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. The Nashville story, 1958-1962. When I returned here in 19, uh, rather in 2006, I had no idea that it would be for this period of time, nor did I have any idea that one of the things that I'd long had in my heart I would be engaged in seeking to do. That is, namely, to do some of the research and the gathering of uh, information that would allow the story of the Nashville movement, 58 to 69, to 62 rather, to be uh, told in a more comprehensive and in a more provocative form. And I have joined with three other colleagues, Dennis Dickerson, and uh, Larry Isaacs and Dan Cornfield for that task uh, of work. And we hope to help um, make the story of the movement here and its importance to the larger piece of American history known. And so my first contention in doing this is the very topic First seek uh, his kingdom and his righteousness, his justice, uh, his truth, and all these things will be yours as well. So my contention for this address this evening is a very simple one, that most of the initiators and promoters of the nonviolent direct action campaigns of Nashville in the 60s were people of the churches who considered themselves doing God's will and fulfilling the kingdom of truth, the kingdom of justice, the kingdom of a better Nashville and a better nation. That was especially true in my own calling. I made the move to Nashville doing what I called following Jesus. I was promoting a nonviolent Jesus, primarily out of the reading of the four Gospels persistently from my childhood to the present moment and the discovering a very different kind of Jesus than what is so often portrayed. I risked my life and thought and ambition following Jesus, which was my personal mantra. Very often when we think of that decade that transformed the face of this nation, we think in terms of civil rights, we think in terms of a secular activity, but I want to push the notion that so many of us whom I can name, students as well as clergy and lay people of all stripes, considered ourselves in fact doing what is really the mission and the life of any authentic religion. That in the midst of a society where you have the mon ignominious business of walking around with all sorts of signs, no colored, no dirty Irish, no 
Polak, no Jap, no Mexican, that in the midst of that kind of a land in the 40s and the 60s, we were a people who wanted to do right and to do good. We wanted to depart from evil and lift up instead the infinite possibilities of human life in Nashville and elsewhere. In his memoir, Walking with the Wind, John Lewis writes that he first heard the phrase, the beloved community in the 1955 workshops that were held here in the city of Nashville in September, October, November and December of 1959 as we prepared for our work in the city. He said that he heard me develop that phrase for the first time and I was using it then as a substitute term for, a substitute phrase, a phrase rather, for the term, the kingdom of Jesus term, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. As far as I know, Josiah Royce of Harvard used that phrase in his book of 1913 called The Problem of Christianity. But I learned the phrase as a student in Ohio in the late 40s and early 50s. I suspect that perhaps Dr. King also learned the concept from Harry Emerson Fosdick who in the first half of the 20th century issued 28 editions by the Association Press at that time of the little book, The Meaning of Faith, and talking about the community of fellowship and the community of faith. Um, Fosdick, without saying where he learned the phrase, but keeping it in quotation marks, uses the term beloved community. I want to drive home this first theme of the evening. We were most likely the finest expression of a Jesus permeated mission in our land. We were bound for the freedom. We were bound for freedom land. We were bound for a destiny of justice and equality and liberty. We did not mean by that some heaven over yonder after death. We meant by freedom land that Jim Crow law and its segregation and all of its unsavory idolatries should be dismantled in the power of the Spirit of God. And we set out the make that begin happen, happening. And no matter what the cost or the risk, the folk in Nashville who organized for change were committed to nothing less than a new Nashville framed after the visions of the scriptures of a new heaven, a new earth. The upheaval in our country between 1953 and 1973 was far too immense, and this is my second theme this evening, to be captured by any one book or memoir. There were far too many activities, far too many people, far too many arrests, far too many demonstrations, far um, um, too many beatings. It was an immense time to be alive. It was a time when in largely a peaceful mode, hundreds of thousands of people acted together. In more than a, a hundred cities, just alone in the southeast, part of the country, there, there were demonstrations in just that one year, 1960. There were too many arenas of action and new, too many negotiations, not for many things to be missed. So I don't uh, fault the many books that have been written where I know personally uh, errors in the book itself. 
I tolerate those errors because the story itself is almost impossible to cover. But my third theme is that the Nashville has not been, Nashville story has not been adequately told. And its role in reinventing the movement, to quote uh, my friend Will Campbell, its role in reinventing the movement in the 1960s is hardly understood. David Halberstam, the late David Halberstam, also a couple of years ago spoke to me in this similar vein. In the research project to which I'm connected, we hope to make that clearer. We already have collected some 25 or 30 videotapes of people who were participants, and my personal goal is that we will have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 or more people that we will recover their stories in that time. Let me now digress to relate this story to you from my perspective. You may not remember any of this, but some of you will recall it. That the late 1950s had been greatly impacted by the Montgomery bus boycott that lasted from December the 5th, 1955 to January the 17th, 1957. It provoked the aspirations and imaginations of people literally around the world. It's hard to recreate that impact upon our nation or upon the visions of countless numbers of unknown people in Latin America and Africa and Asia. I was on December 6, 1955, a missionary in India coaching and uh, as a campus minister at Hislop College. And that morning when I unfolded the Nagpur Times, there in the front pages was the word, uh, 50,000 Negroes boycott in Montgomery, that's the first point at which I read the name of Martin Luther King, Jr. When I traveled in 1957 across Africa, I found pictures of Martin Luther King attached to huts, uh, mud homes of African people living on the shores of Lake Victoria. That was in the air. I shook hands with Dr. King on February the 6th, 1957, in Oberlin for the first time, 19 days after the boycott had ended. Our conversation, our encounter, caused me to make the decision to move south as soon as possible. So in January of 1958, I was settled in Nashville and working for the Fellowship of Reconciliation as the Southern Secretary. This meant that I was a sort of a, tra a troubleshooter. I traveled around the Southeast, visiting people who were in crisis. The Little Rock Nine, uh, as one example, people in Memphis or Charlottesville, Virginia or Greensboro, or Columbia, South Carolina, or Birmingham, and the rest of it many places counseling with persons, but also encouraging and teaching from the nonviolent perspective the meaning of the bus boycott of, uh, of Montgomery. These were people who were already engaged in pushing the status quo for change. Everywhere there was great excitement in the changes that were in the very winds that blew across our land. Martin Luther King Jr. was considered then as a young, exciting voice leading the Montgomery bus boycott but calling the nation to action, to the better side of its history, to the side that insisted that we human beings created and endowed with certain inalienable rights had the capacity to govern ourselves without powers that dictated to us a single way of life or a single understanding of what government meant. 
I traveled everywhere with the bus boycott comic book. I listened to many stories. I heard of Jefferson Thomas, a Baptist deacon in Little Rock, whose son Jeff was one of the Little Rock Nine, saying to me on a street corner after one of our meetings, Reverend, when the bus boycott happened, I prayed to the Lord that if something like that would begin to happen in Little Rock, I would be ready to be there and to participate in it. Often the people I met were under siege, young and old. We did not talk about civil rights. We talked about equality and justice, and we talked about the sacrifices they were making in order to be a part and partial of the change, both in a personal way as well as in the social environment. I discovered many groups like SCLC and the NAACP uh, were wondering what the next step would be. I did workshops on nonviolence at a number of the early SCLC conferences in Columbia and Baton Rouge and elsewhere. They were just beginning their opposition to the status quo and beginning to try to shape what they called redeeming the soul of the nation. Well, I began to become very much aware that in one way the notion of nonviolent struggle and action was on the line. It happened in Montgomery, but can it happen in another way, in a different fashion? Is it a useful device, useful theory, useful methodology? that has power to help people gain power and help turn their conditions and the conditions of their nation in a direction far more hopeful, far more consonant with the best in all of us. Well, this anxiety began to impact me as well. And so along the way, I decided that instead of just being a troubleshooter counseling people, I should think in terms of what could be done in Nashville to demonstrate the efficacy of what happened in Montgomery, Alabama. I talked this over with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, my immediate supervisor, Glenn Smiley, and we agreed that I should give an adequate portion of my time to beginning the organization of a nonviolent campaign here in the city of Nashville. As a part of my work and as a part of the way of following uh, or leading towards the next step for the nation. And so in many ways, though this is not to be found in any of the publications that have been written about Nashville, the story in Nashville in 1958 begins with that decision that I made personally. And then taking that conversation to Kelly Miller Smith and the Nashville, the Nashville Christian Leadership Council and to C.T. Vivian and to Andrew White and to Helen Johns and a number of other folk who were on the executive committee of the NCLC. And so in the fall of 58, we decided that in 1959 we would launch a Gandhian-style operation to help us make a simple decision. What can we do in the city of Nashville from the perspective of Christian nonviolence, uh, structured by Gandhian understandings? Now, I want to point out that it's easy to get mixed up about workshops in Nashville in that period because there were so many of them. Uh, in 1958, NCLC held at least two series of workshops across several days in the spring and in the fall in 58. 
Taylor Branch in his book, Parting of the Waters, gets much of that mixed up. Those were a separate entity and had very little to do with the decision that was made, later made, which I've just uh, reported. Nashville Christian Leadership Conference under the presidency of Kelly Miller Smith made the decision that fall of 1958, 1959 would be our target date. And we called another series of workshops in which all we did for week after week across many Saturdays was to assess the plight of Negro people in the city of Nashville. And as far as I know, no issues were spared. We met across January, February, and March with that sole business of looking at ourselves, looking at our plight, looking at what are the possibilities for changing these conditions and the like. Those workshops were not at First Baptist Church primarily. They were at Greater Bethel AME Church. They were at the Community Church. They were at the Clark Memorial Church. They were at uh, Carrie McDonald's congregation, which, uh, which I do not remember. They went around the city, and sometimes we would have as many as 25 to 60 people I remember a vivid picture at Greater Bethel AME Church that was at then a relatively small building over here on South Avenue. Uh, now is a very fine looking building on the, count, on the corner of South and 12th Street. Um, it was a full house in that fellowship hall. All the seats were taken on that Saturday morning. We didn't try to settle any issues. Which was the most important issue? Which was the worst issue? We heard them all, and we thought about them all. It gave me a stunning picture of life in Nashville that one could not get from the Nashville Tennessean or from the Vanderbilt University Divinity School. It gave me another side entirely of what uh, how some of us were living. Um, David Halberstam, who's written perhaps the best book on the Nashville scene, is quite mistaken on page 91, where he has an entire two paragraphs beginning a chapter on how we were muddled in our thinking about where we would begin um, where, where, where such a fine journalist as David put that together, I'm not sure, or how he put it together, but it simply was not the case. Perhaps he was, perhaps he was comparing workshops in 59 in the winter with workshops in April, May, and June, or with workshops September, October, November, December. I do not know. Because in the spring of 1959, after we did this sort of survey of the plight of millions of people in Nashville, we then wrestled with the second question. Where should we begin to develop a nonviolent campaign to launch change. And again, we wrestled with that for about three months before we finally came to a decision. When I read books that say, well, Jim Lawson made the decision to do these workshops, I can happily say that simply is not true. I came to Nashville and found the community of faith which took me in as a fellow sojourner and gave me opportunities to use the tools that I had been given in 
the skills I had learned in the previous 15 or 20 years about struggle that is consonant with Jesus, struggle that is consonant with the notion, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's an admonition that religion, in a practical sense, may preach, but does not teach as the pragmatic way to pursue the course of compassion or the course of faith. So by June of 1959, we had made the decision we're going to begin downtown. And I want to relate to you how that decision was made, because I had no idea whatsoever how those workshops would come out. But it was the Negro women who prevailed upon what needed to be done. And they talked about the indignity of having a shop in downtown Nashville and always risking insult and hostility. Coming from unexpected quarters, of how they could not try on a hat in any store. It had to be bought without looking in the mirror with it. Now, you know that was a great infringement upon the well-being of women. <laughs> that if they had children, they couldn't buy a pair of shoes. The child could not try them on. Restroom signs marked white colored. Drinking fountains often marked white colored. No place where they could stop and sit down for a moment, especially when they were shopping with their youngsters. And they said to us boldly, you have no idea because you do not shop downtown. You have no idea of the indignity we fear when we have to do shopping for the family. And that was how the decision was made to begin downtown, pull the signs down, eventually get job opportunities for people who shopped in all sorts of places, who banked. There were no access to jobs other than janitorial or maid. A young person could not decide to go in the business and retail business and get a decent piece of work anywhere in Nashville. I remember the names of some of the women, Dolores Wilkerson and Helen Roberts and Janetta Hayes, uh, whose voices rang clear, at least to me. So we said we'll begin and we'll begin in downtown Nashville. And so the workshops in preparation for the movement began then in September and October, November and beyond. Those workshops were held at Clark Memorial United Methodist Church because it was right next to the Fisk campus and therefore was more accessible to a larger number of students. Uh, those workshops framed nonviolence in terms of Jesus of Nazareth rather than in terms of Gandhi. Gandhi perfecting a methodology in the 20th century that does offer us a science of how you bring about political and social and economic change in a fashion without bloodying up everyone and devastating the landscape. But it can be done, and Gandhi, of course, in the 20th century, had some childhood feelings about the necessity of treating people who, people who were different from yourself, people who perhaps were hurtful, not in a, a negative fashion, but respecting the God that was in them, respecting them as human beings in spite of themselves. Um, but I presented nonviolence from the perspective of Jesus. In fact, here David Helberson has it correct. 
because he talks about the workshop where I began with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. One of the great episodes, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more tomorrow, as one of the crowning ex experiences that marks Jesus of Nazareth as a mirror of a God who is a God on the side of nonviolence and truth and not on the sides of wrath and anger and human destruction and human waste of talents. The content of the workshops tried to cover nonviolence from old, and then in the 20th century in the United States where the sit-in movements took place in 1943 and 1942, places like Chicago and Cleveland and Boston and Los Angeles. And I surveyed much of that history, which I began to learn while in college in 1947. Um, the workshops spoke of strategy and methodology, of some of the different techniques, knowing that we were facing the possibility of violence in Nashville, we spent a fair amount of time working on the side of how you might face violence. Can you become, in a sense, a nonviolent soldier who sees the suffering and the injury and the pain as a part of the price you pay for a good cause and a great cause? We did drama and role playing. Sometimes we set up a lunch counter, a a table with four chairs at it and did demonstrations of people coming in to sit down to eat and other people who were harassing, intimidating, and rejecting them for a variety of reasons. We planned a simple strategy in those weeks as well. Sit in as a major technique, and then, if necessary, picket lines and poster walks to create an economic boycott. If necessary, we planned on civil dis disobedience, mass meetings. We strategized how, if arrests became evident, we would meet those arrests. One of the important things that I pushed very hard for these uh, persons in the workshop who were both students and adults who we had more or less recruited. When Wesley Hogan in her very fine book on SNCC says that the students organize the workshops, she's quite mistaken. I do not even know if some of the younger people in the workshops in the fall of 59 had even followed that much the Montgomery bus boycott. But it was as though we were in enemy territory for who in the United States was trying to object in any serious fashion to the violence of our land by lifting up the notion of social change through nonviolence. Well, very quickly, the workshops led to the demonstrations that began in February the 13th, 1960. I read a report in the book, The Origin of the Civil Rights Movement by Alden Morris. That student, that clergy asked the students before that February 13th date to wait. I know nothing about that occurrence. In our meetings in preparation for that first public demonstration, C.T. Vivian was there, and I was there, and Metz, J. Metz Rollins were there, all clergy. DeLois Wilkerson was there, I recall, for I had called the meeting together. Um, where, was there this kind of dissension? I, I do not recall it. Um, from my own experience, at least, there was a unity of purpose and of thought that served us well in the long run. So there are important dates that folk in Nashville today are planning to observe, February the 13th, February the 27th, 
the first mass arrest in Nashville, uh, April the 19th, May the 10th, when several of the merchants downtown reached an agreement with our negotiating committee to begin the quiet process of change. We sought in those days to operate primarily by consensus. We alternated student and adult spokespeople for press conferences and for events and mass meetings. On May 10th, Nashville led the way in the southeastern part of the country in signs coming down, renovations taking place in restrooms, and eating places serving all the members of the public. That movement continued for almost a decade as it moved from downtown across the city. Some places like Morrison Cafeteria would not budge, and there was a fair amount of violence in 60 and 61 and 62, as the sit-ins continued there, the owners of that cafeteria changed with the passing of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 only, the bill that abolished signs and said um, public arenas must be opened to everyone across the land. In the fall of 1960, we turned to the theaters spring of 1961, we turned to obtaining better jobs for black people in the grocery stores, AMP and Kroger store. In May of 1961, Nashville basically changed the climate uh, over uh, the Freedom Rides, of which John Lewis was a member. Um, for at least a decade after 1960. You had a central committee as a structure for movement, and the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference that worked hand in hand as one movement uh, to help create uh, in Nashville a climate for change and make it a very different city today than it was then. Let me then finally put Nashville in this larger struggle. For the movement was critical here for a variety of reasons. In the first place, the movement in 59 and 60, 61 became a model movement uh, across uh, the southeast. We taught nonviolence as a sort of a boot camp, to take one of the students' words, asking everyone to participate for both principal and pragmatic reasons, insisting that in nonviolence we could be almost like with, could have almost military precision in our disciplined ac actions and then with our strategic concerns so that Nashville became the form of nonviolence that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference adopted, King calling it a model movement and a movement that inspired him personally. The plan that we worked out for opening up in downtown Nashville was a plan that later I heard being called the Dallas Plan and then in Memphis, when I moved there as a pastor in 1962, it was called the Memphis Plan. <laughs> but it came from Nashville, borrowed by chambers of commerces in those two cities, because they learned of the effective, quiet fashion in which change took place, and in fact, many respects caused downtown Nashville to look quite differently. We in Nashville saved the movement at large from a strategic error, an error that some of us felt would be 
fatal, could be fatal. You know of the Freedom Ride in 1961, and how in Alabama, at Anniston, Alabama, and then in Birmingham, it met mobs of people who burned one bus and attacked the riders with, with a violence that the nation had rarely seen. The 13 people who were on that initial bus ride from Washington, D.C., hopefully to go to New Orleans, were so battered and bruised by the violence they met in the long hours, primarily in Alabama, that they went, when they reached Birmingham, they voted to end the ride and fly to New Orleans basically cancel out the rest of it. Well, in Nashville, we had done in-depth study and examination of nonviolence strategically. And one of the things that I taught, as Gandhi taught, was that when the opponents react in a violent fashion, your, your movement must stop for a moment and assess the situation and figure out if strategically you can move through that opposition or around it or over it. But you must not allow the incidents of violence to be used as a pretense that you do not have either the right or the power uh, to assemble on the behalf of equality and justice. And so when we in Nashville heard that decision, um, the Central Committee met the better part of a day and a night wrestling with that meaning. The, the Central Committee determined that Nashville itself would pick up the ride and we would send people to Birmingham to continue that freedom ride from Birmingham to Montgomery and we would see to it that that ride continued on to at least Jackson, Mississippi. Um, our people were almost unanimous. I was not in Nashville at the time. I was away for two or three days at that moment. But I was kept in touch, uh, I was kept in touch by phone and agreed with the decision and the strategy and pledged my own participation in the Freedom Ride as soon as I got returned to Nashville. Well, that was a strategic move rooted in the notion of nonviolent theory and practice. And of course, what happened as a consequence, so there was a great outcry against this ha occurring. What did happen was that Literally hundreds of people participated in the Freedom Ride from that time on. Many of us served time in two or three different jails in Jackson, Mississippi. It became a national uh, agenda. The Kennedy administration responded in part uh, by trying to manage it and control it, but nevertheless recognized that it was a call to the nation to take new steps to make hospitality and travel available to all the residents of our nation. The Nashville movement therefore helped the Albany movement to de develop, became a model for that movement, for the Birmingham campaign of 1963. Our training activities spread across the southeast through a sizable number of us who became staff people and others for Southern Christian Leadership Conference, for the American Friends Service Committee, for the Congress of Racial Equality, for unions, for voting, voter registration projects. No other movement anywhere in the country produced the people like John Lewis or Lester McKinney, McKinsey, or Pauline Knight, 
Jim Bevel, or a, a, a long list of people who peopled throughout that decade many of the major causes for struggle in what Vincent Harding calls the Black Southern Freedom Movement. We were engaged in Albany and Birmingham and Selma in the Washington March and the Freedom Ride and the Mississippi March for, against fear in Chicago, in St. Augustine and Danville, Virginia and a great range of other places for much of the remainder of the decade. A movement that caused in the mind of Martin Luther King Jr to create tens of millions of Americans. He called them the Coalition of Conscience. From literally every part of the land and from every creed and class and group, and complexion, and denomination and the rest of it, who clamored on Congress and on the President Johnson to make changes called for the eradication of Jim Crow law and for the dismantling of segregation. That dismantling of racism and segregation did not happen in that decade or in the decade following, but the process for the first time of a nation facing what Jim Wallace has called its own original sin and the concomitant economic and political forces of that sin did begin. It has come a good distance. We may have a longer distance to go. But I'm persuaded that people of faith in the 21st century should not look towards the James Dobsons for the models for religious practice in the public arena. I'm persuaded that many of the voices that have a hearing are voices of faith which are not voices at all of the deep abiding spirituality of the Hebrew Christian scriptures or of the vision of the Jesus of Nazareth. I am persuaded that the struggles in the 21st century will be more heroic than any of the struggles of the past 200 or 300 years of the people of America seeking to become a people where there is truly genuine access to the blessings of freedom and equality and justice. And I maintain that if those struggles are to continue, which they will regardless of our perspective, the Nashville model for mission, for the change of life personal and the change of life social, the Nashville story is one of the places, one of the stories that we need to recover Because there's no more important task than the business of we ordinary human beings taking our deepest values which we practice in home, in neighborhood, and in congregation, the values of compassion and truth and of human affection and human community. There's no more important task than for us ordinary people to understand many of the powers that be in our nation and world are wrong. That the way to a future with infinite possibility is not evil for evil, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. To take the principles in which we were created by the creator, the principle of life itself and love itself, and truth itself and beauty and use those 
virtues in practical daily ways can help us reshape the status quo and reframe a future where we are people governing ourselves willingly and loving, lovingly. The national story, I urge you to look at it carefully as a model for the engagement the religious with the political and the secular in our own time. challenge. So if anyone who would like to uh, pose a question, got to raise a hand, yes. Dr. Lawson, when you were, when you realized you were going to be uh, sending young people into possible death, how did you ever deal with that? Well, of course, um, we spoke of death and suffering, um, but at the same time, it seems to me there's a, no greater service to one's own life or to one's own people or to one's own society than to be willing to risk injury and, yea, even death on behalf of turning against uh, cruelty and injustice and allowing the possibilities of new forms of life to take place. Um, and um, I didn't see myself sending them to that. I saw myself within the context of a movement that was emerging. I saw myself within the context of people of faith around the National Christian Leadership Council. And then I insisted that the choice was a personal choice. That we wanted people to make up their own minds in their own way, to participate or not participate. So the, the workshops fundamentally were an invitation. <laughs> and someone like John Lewis says that the workshops fundamentally changed his life um, John Lewis, the congressman from Atlanta, now in Congress, uh, says that the, in his memoir that it fundamentally changed his life, his understanding of who he was and what he was about. And that was a major beginning point. Jim, it seems that Fred Cloud, I see you. Good to see you all. A long time. <laughs> um, it seems that we are confronted today in the United States with the uh, ascendancy of greed and that persons of wealth and institutions of wealth are um, putting human values at the bottom of the heap. On ABC News tonight, they said that um, homes were being foreclosed at a rate of about 10,000 a day. And uh, many of those were because of scams, of persons being oversold. Um, 
I've been working for 10 years with the Tennessee Fair Housing Council, and we knew several years ago that these foreclosures were coming, and I said, why doesn't the government do something? But it looks like the um, lobbyists for um, housing and banks and security companies um, are more concerned with their own profits than with the people. How can we rally human beings in sufficient numbers to turn this around? It is, it is destroying uh, much of middle America. You ask me. Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, I think in middle America, too many of us are living out of our comfortable places, and we do not want to attach ourselves to the folk who are experiencing these 10,000 a day uh, foreclosures and evictions. In the 1920s and 30s, in lots of places in the country, with the last Great Depression, uh, neighbors organized uh, their neighborhoods and their communities in such a fashion that they surrounded houses that were that people were being evicted out of and foreclosed out of, and, and prevented the sheriffs from serving their notices and the rest of it. Now that's that that is a form of nonviolent action that we don't hear about it, and many of us are not aware that it did take place in the United States um, uh, in the last Great Depression. So th that's one possibility. But I think, generally speaking, there has to be another uprising in the United States among we the people. But just as we delivered in 2008 a vote calling for a change and a shift in our emphasis and the rest of it, that's good, but that's not enough. We, are, we will need as a people to put hundreds of thousands and millions of people in the streets so that the agenda on behalf of the American people will take precedence in the White House and Congress over the Pentagon over the lobbyists of all sorts who are demanding that our society be run by them rather than by the well, for the well-being of the American people. I, I foresee those kinds of movements as being essential from a nonviolent perspective. I, I would just simply remind you that in Germany, East Germany in 1988-89, Small groups of people became millions of people in the streets of Leipzig, West, uh, uh, East Berlin, Dresden, and elsewhere that uh, demanded government change. And the government did collapse in East Germany um, in October, as I remember, of 1989. And, and while we write a different story. The reality was that all through 89, they had hundreds of thousands of people in the streets with candles calling for a more, a better society, calling for the government to pay attention to what needed to be done. So if that was necessary for an authoritarian society, it might even be more necessary for we who feel that we are a democratic society. Good evening, Dr. Lawson. Um, Hi. I find today that sometimes religion can serve as a barrier to our ability to come together and organize. Uh, I was interested in knowing if during your time of organizing the heyday, was there much cooperation across religious belief, uh, religious affiliation, faiths, and even denominations? There's much more today than then, but in the case of the movement, we were interdenominational, that's true. Uh, and there was support 
across racial lines at different ways in different places. But I think that far more people in the churches today are aware of the unity of the human race before God uh, than even in 1960. So I, I, I think interfaith work and interreligious unity and working together is more critically important. In, in Los Angeles, I had the privi privilege as pastor of Holman United Methodist Church to uh, help create Interfaith Task Force on Hunger back in the 80s, the Interfaith Task Force on uh, Nuclear Disarmament, the Interfaith Task Force on Homelessness and Hunger. Um, and uh, these, these were cases in 1996, I was able to organize an interfaith group called Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, working on the issue of the working poor, being able to organize in democratic unions that would allow them to lift their condition on their own, to empower them to raise their consciousness. So I would say that today there is much more interreligious, there's an interreligious consciousness that doesn't always get heard, but it is going on in places like Nashville and Wichita, Kansas, and, and uh, Los Angeles. Those of us that work in the urban context have access to some tremendous strategies for conflict resolution and conflict transformation that owe much to the principles you're talking about. But the challenge often is to be cohesive in our work. We are often so disparate, spread so wide with our own agendas that we lack this unitive power you've talked about from the Nashville experience. What one thing out of the Nashville experience do you think is needed today to pull us together so we're not so disparate? Well, I don't think you, I don't think we have to wait until we are able to pull ourselves together to make things happen. From the nonviolent perspective, the, the, the immediate task is for a group of people, small or larger, to focus in on a priority issue that they're going to work with short term and long term, and to do strategizing around it, to do recruitment and education around it, and to begin the process then of making the change that they see can be made. That, that that's the beginning place, and, the, and that kind of a beginning will attract some other people besides the ones you know and are able to recruit. So I think we should not wait until we think there is a unity. There can be a unity that grows out of recruitment, investigation, engagement in your own local scene that can help develop a, re a, a unity. Jim? Um, first, a quick John? comment and then a continuation of a conversation that you and I have been having uh, by way of a question. The comment is just that I am keenly aware that my presence in this country and in this school is a result of the Immigration and Naturalization Act that I take to be a direct outgrowth of the Civil Rights Movement. 1965. That's right. <laughs> so I, I think yeah. that it's mm -hmm. interesting that I'm here teaching at, mm -hmm. at Nashville. Uh, and so your, your comments today made me even more mindful about the connection between what happened in Nashville and the very possibility of my presence here. So for that, a, a note of thanks. Uh, my question concerns something that I heard in today's talk, but also in some of the important literature Namely, that you and Martin and others really arrived at a community that was already ready and embraced you in some respects. They, mm -hmm. they needed perhaps methodology, but there yeah. was something already brewing in the community. Right. And, I, mm -hmm. and I want to know something more about that. And the way I want to phrase it is, is, is this. What in African-American practices of reading the gospel prepared the reception for Gandhi's also reading of the gospel? 
Uh, I tell my students that without Gandhi, uh, the, the great Beatitudes would largely be platitudes. Uh, that, that there is something about his reading that, that en enabled persons to <laughs> discover a different Jesus, um, and the Jesus that you speak of. I'd like to know more about, in your estimate, uh, ways of reading biblical traditions in African American communities that prepared for that reception. Uh, yes, well, I think um, it should be said that the religion of the slaves for 250 years was quite different from the religion of Main Street churches and of white Christianity in the United States. That is to be found in the literature of the Negro spiritual. It's to be found, found in many mem memoirs from the past. Um, For the most part, our people never accepted slavery as being their just reward. We resisted in many different ways, and one of the ways was the, resi was the spiritual and inward resistance to imitating the slave rape. Some of the annals speak of the slave, of, as some of the annals speak rather of the preachers who traveled from plantation to plantation preaching, you are not a slave, you are a child of God. Live by that standard. Well, this is fundamentally the sort of preaching I heard in my own congregations as a boy. My father is the grandson of an escaped slave who went up into Canada, uh, possibly escaping from slavery out of Virginia and settled in Canada where my dad was born and a young man who decided he was going to move back to live and move to the United States and live and become a citizen here. So that's the kind of preaching I heard from my dad, <laughs> that, that you are a child of God, you are somebody, and I will never forget some of the experiences as a child where, in fact, this was reinforced by my mother and my father when I wanted to go off in different directions. <laughs> so um, I think this is part of the context. The other thing I do would say is to quote Martin Luther King Jr., who on his, in his first speech in um, the bus boycott, uh, December the 5th, 1956, at the Holt Street Baptist Church. It's a very interesting speech that not too many of us know about it. I read, read it first in the, Boston, in the papers of King in, at Boston University in the 70s. Um, in that speech, he said, there comes a time when we get tired of oppression. We are tired of the indignity that we have to live under. There was a lot of that present in the 50s and the 60s, so that when I went to Scott Church in Shelbyville, there are those who said that that they would not accept me because I was um, infamous from Nashville. But um, Dorothy and I found some of the finest people we've ever pastored at Scott Church in Shelbyville. They surrounded us with all sorts of goodwill and support and cooperation. And in fact, when I was in jail, in Mississippi on the Freedom Ride, Scott's church people affirmed me in every way they could as being their pastor. So th th there was that. Th there was a sense of, uh, of um, weariness and there was a sense of hope at the same moment that, that 
we, that we have fed into. That we, that we, that we found. It was very different. Now that was quite different from oftentimes white Christianity. My own denomination, United Methodist Church, I began meeting in 1940s as a, as a youth officer of the annual conference level and then later in the regional and national levels. I began to meet white youngsters in the Methodist Youth Fellowship, which was a pretty strong movement at that time. I began to meet them who came out of southern Illinois, out of Virginia, out of Alabama, in various national regional meetings, who told me of their pain of breaking in the spirit of Jesus with their parents over the issue of racial prejudice and segregation. Sometimes these persons were disowned by their families. And sometimes the um, families would see to it that their daughter or son would leave the community to go to college and stay away, lest the family get into difficulty if they were present and speaking their mind about some of these matters. So I think that contrasts what I met in a majority white denomination uh, where in the, the black church there was a receptivity of inclusiveness um, and the tendency in the white congregation in the same denomination to allow cultural matters to interfere with the authentic spirituality of, of uh, human accord and affection. And I'm using the term affection deliberately because it's a John Wesley term. <laughs> Human affections, and I, I like it since I read it some years ago. He, 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 uh, he in, uh, said that, uh, that uh, he understood the humanity that explodes in one's life by grace. He saw that in terms of human affection. That was his way of speaking about uh, the humanity that exploded in a person's life. So, uh, I use that term deliberately, human affection. Well, when, when you see me in the audience, you know that I'm, I'm what I'm going to ask you about. We were there at the Immigrant Freedom Ride, and you inspire uh -huh. us to keep the Freedom Ride going. Oh, you were. And, uh -huh. and yeah. you were right. there at the, uh, when we took to the street in all six to bring the immigrants uh, yes, uh -huh. out of the shadows. Yes, uh -huh. and, uh, and last year, of course, we were in D.C. sitting there in the liaison where you were inspiring us to pass immigration reform. And I guess and, yes, uh -huh. you have always been that beacon keeping us going and you talk about the faith. But I think that some of us uh, immigrants, or as I heard many times being called as I've been here in Tennessee and also in Georgia, us illegals, um, we are holding on to that faith, but I'm asking you uh, to kind of speak to uh, the wisdom of do you see immigration reform in the horizon, and what is that word of wisdom to keep us going? And I think in, in the Gamaliel Foundation, we always look to you, to CT, to Joseph Elwanger, to keep us in the faith, but Right now, it's, it's really hard to keep the faith as a illegal uh, in this environment. Uh, it's a big question, sign of hope. I think the hope is that the immigration, the immigrant community will not allow themselves to yield to the hatred and to the cries of illegal because this is, not just, this is a cry that's used against all kinds of people, most of whom are, have all their papers, and many of whom are citizens of the society. So it's a loosely used epithet to discourage people. So I think the sign of hope is that, that you organize in Nashville, and you talk about your common experiences, 
and you impose upon those common experiences a different perspective, that perspective being, in my judgment, very simple, there is no such thing as an illegal human being in the sight of God. There's no such thing as an undocumented human being. It's the, it's the failure of our societies in the Western world to deal properly with the right of people to move where they think they need to move if they want to get a better opportunity for themselves, and so forth and so on. That's what it says in the Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, which we as a nation have still not ratified. It says that people have the right to go and live where they want to live, and it's the responsibility of governments to make this possible in a fashion that eases some of the political and social pressure. So you need to impose upon yourselves a different faith and perspective that we in the United States need. And then I think that you need to keep organizing around nonviolent theory and practice because immigration reform is on the low side of the political agenda in Congress or in the White House today. Um, not even fixing immigration because there's a, I don't know what the wait list now is. Do you know, Keith, what the waiting list for getting to the window? I mean, the, the wait list at one time across the United States was seven years to get to the window. So there's not even the push going on to uh, to take responsibility for that seven-year or ten-year wait that people go through before they can get their right papers for the United States. There's not even a push for that. So you have to keep, I think, strategizing and organizing change here in Nashville. And I think that's the possibility. We've got time for two more questions. I see a gentleman here and right over there. Uh, question one is, did you anticipate or were you surprised by the support that you received from the faculties and others at Vanderbilt uh, following your arrest and expulsion? And second of all, is there anything inconsistent about your not coming back to Vanderbilt and going on to Boston as regards the theory that you laid out about sort of sticking to it and stay in the course and, and go? Well, um, in the first instance, Dorothy and I made the decision that um, we should not wait for Vanderbilt to catch up, <laughs> but we should go on to Boston and finish up. Um, the offer for me to finish at Boston was that We'll take all your credits from Oberlin and Vanderbilt, and uh, we'll arrange for you to do a course of study while you're here for six weeks in the summer, and you can march in August. So we thought that the option of marching in August rather than May was a good option, so we took it. And the decisions then made at Vanderbilt followed that. Um, I did not... Uh, I thought it was a good compromise, and I said that to a number of the Divinity School professors who called me to tell me about it, that it was a good compromise for the faculty, and for the Divinity School, and the whole faculty of Vanderbilt. You may or may not know that story, that the Divinity School faculty was pretty much gone in May of 1960 after a very heroic effort to negotiate change with which I cooperated. Um, but the chancellor's office turned them down, and so they turned in their letters of resignation. You may not know, however, that a young physicist by the name of Charles Roos, who's still alive in Nashville, retired now, had been meeting weekly with various faculty people. And as soon as the Divinity School offer was turned down, then Charles Roos walked into the chancellor's office, at which time he found also the chairman of the board, Harold Vanderbilt. 
and he was a spokesperson for a sizable percentage of the faculty across the university. Most of the law school, most of the engineering school, most of the uh, medical school, and faculty in many other sections in the university had written a letter, their letter, of resignation from the university if a compromise were not reached with, that was satisfactory to the divinity school. So fundamentally, the university and the excellent work from my point of view, <laughs> in many ways, that uh, Chancellor Harvey Branscombe had done was now under uh, threat. And so they, that very day, uh, hammered out a compromise which the Divinity School faculty accepted and the rest of the faculty accepted, and those resignations were not turned in. So I remained because I did not want to do another interruption of my work. And the compromise was satisfactory from my point of view of compromise, but there was a stipulation in there that I should not return to the campus until September, at which time I could uh, pick up my course of studies with the professors I had when I was expelled on, in March and to their satisfactory finish the course and the degree would be granted. Um, but the most serious reason why I did not return, uh, besides personal disruption, was the fact that uh, the dean at that time, J. Robert Nelson, who was one of the uh, bright and shiny stars in the university as a whole, dean of the Divinity School, was summarily basically fired. His resignation was accepted immediately the other faculty people were not. And I felt that there was, therefore, making someone pay <laughs> for the mistakes of the university. And uh, I felt I would not come back at that time, therefore. All right, final question. Keith Caudwell yep. is a community organizer and a student at American Baptist College. He's one of the people I've come to know in the last five years, six years, seven years. Good man. Thank you. Reverend Lawson, um, yeah. I, as you revisit the 50 years and the um, powerful events that have changed the culture, I'm aware that you are still very much involved in the practices of the work today. Uh, in our conversations, I've heard Reverend Ed Sanders talk about th this racism and the fear that people have of calling racism what it is, and it's taken on more con covert forms. So you talked about the signs. What would be the equivalent of the signs today that you think could catalyze folks into action? I'm not sure that we should be looking for signs equivalent to the signs of the 40s or 50s or 60s. I don't know what I'm saying. But I think that in part we have to recognize that racism has morphed in different ways in the 21st century. It is 17th generational racism in the United States. I don't know if you've thought about this, but it, it really began in you know, the 17th century and this is our 17th century, um, this is our 17th generation of people on these shores. So it's very problematic. The, the one point that I would see is this, that to leave racism out of the diagnosis of what ails us as a people is a major strategical and theoretical mistake that as difficulty, as difficult and perplexing as it might be, I maintain as a pastor and 
preacher that the influences on the inside of our lives of racism, sexism, violence, and greed are so, uh, the, the, the influence is so critical on the American scene uh, that some people like Russ Limbaugh have a strategic sense by pretending that other people are playing the race card. They can drive the good people off the field for the kind of sensible discussion of these matters that we need in the churches and synagogues and outside as well. So, but strategically, I suspect we need to think anew that there may be no white colored sign. There may be another kind of sign that can engage us and engage our imagination for a 21st century uh, effort. Thank you, and if you... Thank you, Jim. We hope you will all join us uh, as you're able for a uh, reception afterwards in which you may uh, greet Dr. Lawson, uh, and that you will come back at 10 o'clock tomor tomorrow morning uh, when, in fact, we do turn uh, to, to now and the future. 10 o'clock, uh, right back here at Ben Chapel. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you, Dr. Lawson.